coming up on the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. People with coronary disease had an excess of small LDL particles. Well, research out of University of California, Berkeley, Hopkins, and other uh, notable institutions, not my research, other people's research, showed that the only things that cause small LDL particles that are very oxidation prone, able to get in the wall of the artery, very adhesive, the artery tissue, and lasted five to seven days rather than the normal 24 hours. Mm. The only foods that cause that, wheat, grains, and sugars. So I had people take that out of their diet. And that's when I, right, that's when I saw people not only reduce small LDL from, say, 1,800 nanomoles per liter to zero, but they would also lose 73 pounds. Type 2 diabetics would become non-diabetic. People with high blood pressure got off three, four medications. People with uh, migraine headaches got complete relief. Or, uh, skin rashes uh, went away. In other words, it was a complete transformation. Hello, and welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I'm Brian Grin, and I'm here to give you actionable tips to get your body back to what it once was 5, 10, even 15 years ago. Each week, I'll give you an in-depth interview with a health expert from around the world to cut through the fluff and get you long-term sustainable results. This week, I interviewed cardiologist and New York Times bestselling author of Wheat Belly, Dr. William Davis. We discuss the issues wheat and grains are causing on your health, the problem with our current healthcare system, along with the role vitamin D plays in your health, how to improve your microbiome, problems with commercial probiotics, and is one tip to get your body back to what it once was. I really enjoyed my interview with Dr. William Davis. He has a ton of great energy, and we also get into his new book, Super Gut, as well. So check that out. Enjoy the interview, and thanks so much for listening. All right. Welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. My name is Brian Grin, and I have Dr. William Davis on. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, my pleasure. We were just talking uh, to Midwestern guys, um, which is unique, I guess, uh, nowadays, huh? Everyone's every, well, everyone's moving, going from the north to the south is what's happening. Yeah, it gives me perverse satisfaction, though, when people in North Carolina and Texas are complaining about the snow. <laughs> uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they don't know what to do when it snows. You know, it's like a <laughs> disaster. Uh -huh. um, well, let, we got a lot of directions we can go. Let's first touch um, your cardiologist, right? You practice for mm -hmm. what, 25 years? Mm -hmm. And then maybe fill in the blanks there. And then you obviously you have that best selling book, Wheat Belly, which, you know, I, I'm assuming what year was that? 2011. Okay. And then where has that led you down? Now you got a new book coming out called Super Gut. And so um, how did you sort of go down that path? Well, the wheat belly experience really started with me trying to give people with coronary disease, you know, practicing as a cardiologist. But, you know, when I saw my mom die of sudden cardiac death after her successful two vessel coronary angioplasty, it, you know, that was my world. I was in the cath lab every day, morning till night, putting in stents, doing atherectomies, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. My mom dies of the disease. She was in New Jersey, dies of the disease that I thought I knew something about. So it was a vivid illustration, Brian, of how unsatisfactory it really is to try to deliver a procedure for a, a condition like a heart attack, heart disease, coronary disease. Mm -hmm. I, I set up the first uh, scanner, heart scanner in Wisconsin. This goes way back there. At the time, back then, there were two scanners in Chicago. And uh, this was the first scanner in, in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And we scanned people left and right. And you may have uh, heard that you know, when you start to look for silent early coronary disease, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Because you're detecting it two, five, 10, 20 years before it you know, causes heart attack or cause you to die or need a procedure. Uh, but back then, this is 25 some years ago, something like that. Well, back then, I even I would tell people, oh, well, take a statin drug at high dose, cut your fat, cut your saturated fat, eat more healthy whole grains, mm. <laughs> exercise, right? Uh, and you know what? So we help publish these data. If you do nothing, so when you do a heart scan, you get a coronary calcium score. Normal is zero. No calcium as an index of atherosclerotic plaque, because calcium occupies 20% of all plaque volume. So normal score zero, where I'm, ha I'm having thousands of people, scores of 300, 500, 1,000, 1,500. 
Um, when you get to about a thousand or so, your risk of dying or heart attack is about 15% per year. So it's very high risk. So the writing's on the wall when you get these kinds of scores. So if you do nothing, which is foolhardy, it goes up 25% per year, taking you closer and closer and closer to dying, heart attack. I mean, scary stuff, right? Oh, yeah. If you go on a high dose statin drug, low fat diet, exercise program, aspirin, it goes up 25% per year, has zero impact. And so people are freaking out. My colleagues, such as they are, many of them told these people, well, you need a real test, a heart catheterization, see if you need a preventive stent or bypass, which by the way, is largely malpractice. It's, it's dishonest, it's, it's not right, it's, it's practically malpractice, but it's done all the time. Hmm. Uh, scare people, scare the heck out of them into a procedure. I, Brian, I can't, I can't speak for your safety. You're a walking time bomb. You've heard all these things my colleagues like to say. Well, I was unhappy with that. The experts said, well, don't repeat a scan to see if it increased. Just let them have their heart attacks and deal with it in the hospital. They actually said that, Brian. They actually said that. Well, I thought that was, I thought that sucked. I thought it was terrible. So I set out to look for better ways to deal with it. A lot of zigzagging, a lot of trial and error. One of the lessons, for instance, was adding vitamin D. It was the first time I saw scores not do that, but drop, drop plummet with a vitamin D. Huge effect. But it also, it also became clear that managing cholesterol was a fool's game. It's ridiculous. It doesn't do anything uh, or, or virtually nothing. And so I did a different kind of testing. It's called lipoprotein testing. The most common is NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. It just takes your plasma and it fractionates the proteins. And it was clear people with coronary disease had an excess of small LDL particles. Well, research out of University of California, Berkeley, Hopkins, and other uh, notable institutions, not my research, other people's research, showed that the only things that cause small LDL particles that are very oxidation prone, able to get in the wall of the artery, very adhesive, the artery tissue, and lasted five to seven days rather than the normal 24 hours. Mm. The only foods that cause that, wheat, grains, and sugars. So I had people take that out of their diet. And that's when I, right, that's when I saw people not only reduce small LDL from, say, 1,800 nanomoles per liter to zero, but they would also lose 73 pounds. Type 2 diabetics would become non-diabetic. People with high blood pressure got off three, four medications. People with uh, migraine headaches got complete relief. Or, uh, skin rashes uh, went away. In other words, it was a complete transformation. And I, at first I thought, what the heck? I do the exact opposite of what every dietitian, doctor, and dietary guidelines says to do. <laughs> and I see amazing. Well, so that experience showed me how powerful this was. But it also showed me that not everybody went 100% all the way back to health. So like weight loss, people would say, I lost 73 pounds, but I got 45 more to go. <laughs> I'm stuck. Right. Mm -hmm. Or my rheumatoid arthritis is much better. I'm off the biologic. You're saving me $4,000 a month. <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. off the prednisone, but I have to go back on the naproxen every so often because I'm having mo modest flares. Well, right. I asked them, why? And why were some like... One really prominent, persistent problem was food intolerances. Hmm. So I asked, what the hell is going on here that, does, that keeps people from going back 100%? On, and that's when I looked in the microbiome. And Brian, that's when I just came across some astounding kinds of new strategies. Yeah, we'll definitely touch on those today. Um, I'm curious, like any of your colleagues, have they changed their paths um, because of you and, and the road that you went down? as far as what they were doing traditionally to, you know, what they're doing today? You know, in the uh, 11 years or so since Wheat Belly came out, there, there is a growing number of physicians, not because they're curious about diet. For the most, I'm talking about mainstream physicians, you know, functional medicine docs, naturopaths, they are much better at this than mainstream MDs. Mm -hmm. Mainstream MDs tend to have their head in the sand about health. They're more concerned. I, I can tell you in prior years, if, uh, in practice, I was much more interested in the newest brand of stent, you know, drug eluding stent or the newest rotational atherectomy device or something, right. and, and not interested very much in nutrition and health. That unfortunately remains true for most of my colleagues. They're, they're experts in health care, 
that is the pharmaceuticals and procedures for uh, in healthcare that generate revenue, they're far less interested in health. And so sadly, a guy like you sits down with the doctor, you know more about health than he does or she does. Yeah. They, and that's, I'm generalizing, of course, there are right. exceptions. But for the most part, doctors have chosen to be willfully ignorant of the things that don't generate revenue. They even say most, they say outrageous things. You know, it's the only field I know of where, where the doctors, where people can deliver ignorance mm -hmm. with absolute authority. Now, I see it every day. Is part of this just the, the, the basis of their trainings are being funded a certain way, obviously, pharmaceuticals and things like that. And they're just being trained this way. And I mean, obviously, yeah, is it their fault or is it more going back to, you know, what, what is leading them to this path? I, I think we can lay blame on a number of factors. Yeah. You're right. The nature of education, where there's virtually no education, in nutrition, nutrients, uh, natural methods. It's starting to change, but it's just in its infancy still. Right. There's also, you know, if I if I show somebody how to eat better or get their vitamin D correct or help to, uh, uh, reset their microbiome, you can't charge much for doing that. You might charge for an office, office visit, mm. uh, but you can't charge the thousands and thousands of dollars that are paid for replacing a knee, inserting a stent, putting in an implantable defibrillator. Uh, all those kinds of things. So there tends to be a very heavy bias towards revenue generating activities. And it, it's this reality of the thing. So now maybe in a generation, you know, yeah. 20, 30 years, it'll get better. I don't think you and your and me and, our, and your listeners should wait for that because that's what happens. It takes about 17 to 20 years for practicing physicians to catch up to the science. But I don't even think they'll even try to catch up with science because I don't, you know, if you have an ophthalmologist who makes thousands of dollars every time he makes an injection into your um, retina, why would he stop to tell you and take a half an hour to educate you on how to preserve eye health? Mm -hmm. He can't be bothered. It's, it doesn't pay. And so it's the perversions the, of the economics of the healthcare system. Now, right. that's all very cynical. But so my response is screw the healthcare system. Don't even try because it's failed. It's a broken trillion, $3 trillion system. And if we get mad and try to educate the doctor, yeah, good luck, right? You can't. So what it means is you and me and your listeners really have to take the reins of health yourself. You know, that's the bad news. The good news is the tools have gotten so powerful for people to take the reins of their health themselves that you can achieve. And I, I need to make this, uh, I need to emphasize this. The health we obtain, Brian, doing these natural methods is not almost as good as mm -hmm. the healthier doctor dispenses. The health we achieve using our own methods are superior, dramatically superior to what the doctor can provide. Cause all the doctor has is pharmaceuticals and procedures. That's not health. Yeah. Um, actually I just interviewed uh, Dr. Jason Fung and talk about just, you know, here's a ne nephrologist and um, now we obviously big into fasting um, and a lot of times, you know, fasting, it's free, it's easy. I, I shouldn't say some people it's not easy, but you know, it's something that you can do. Everyone can do it and it can cause tons of healing, um, in certain, you know, aspects. And, um, yeah, it's, you know, it's like, we have a lot at our disposal. We just have to sort of figure out what, what will work. Mm -hmm. And so are you saying there's, there's not a place really for stents as far as, um, you know, if people come and they're, and they have blockage and things like that. You know, in the latter half of my practice, the last maybe seven, eight, nine, ten years or so, and my online audience, I've seen, and I'm talking to a lot of people, including in my practice, who are high risk. These are people who had a heart attack, survived a heart attack, survived sudden cardiac death, had three stents when they came to me, you know, mm -hmm. um, had, I won't say high cholesterol, but had lipoprotein and lipid abnormalities that put them at higher risk, or that, that type two diabetics, et cetera. But having a heart attack, needing a procedure, vanished, the need almost vanished to zero. Hmm. Among people who did the program, if you said, I, I did have patients who say, screw you, I'm going to smoke cigarettes, eat badly, I eat fast food, well, that guy's going to have a heart attack, right? right? But the people who said, okay, all right, I see the rationale, let's give it a try, I will eat no wheat grains or, or sugar, so I don't provoke formation of small LDL, I'll take fish oil to reduce my VLDL and triglycerides, I'll get my vitamin D up to the ideal range, 
I'll get my thyroid measures in order. I'll take iodine. I'll take magnesium because I drink filtered water. And there's no magnesium. And I'm going to take steps to cultivate a healthy microbiome. Those people, Brian, virtually zero. I can count maybe on two fingers of the thousands of people who are high risk who end up having any kind of cardiac event. Hmm. So I can't get, can't say zero, but damn sure. close to zero. Yeah, no, it, it makes sense. And as far as vitamin D, you know, cause obviously we're both in the Midwest, this comes up a lot is what's the best way. To, I mean, obviously, I guess what's the best way to get that? Um, is it through the sun? Cause I, you know, you hear differing opinions. The best way to run naked in a tropical sun. Oh, perfect. Well, yeah. <laughs> that sounds so, fun. So could you run naked in Chicago? Well, you can't do that, right? Got to um, wear clothes. Yeah. I'd probably get arrested. <laughs> we work indoors. We work at a lat. We live at a latitude where even if it was July, it's still hard to get sufficient activation of D in the skin. Hmm. And you know what? You like, you're like me. When you go outside, even in the summertime, you got a lot of your surface area covered. And as we age past, particularly past age 40, you progressively lose the capacity to activate vitamin D in the skin. I, I actually think that the loss of the ability to activate vitamin D is nature's way of pushing us out the door hmm. because all the consequences of vitamin D deficiency, osteoporosis, cancers, coronary disease, stroke, dementia, those are all the diseases of aging. So uh, I think it's because after you reach reproductive age, you had children, raise them to their reproductive age, which is 12 <laughs> in hmm. a primitive society, you're no longer needed by, by the world at least from a survival standpoint. And so um, uh, getting sun would be nice if it worked. Right. What doesn't work these latitudes, we wear clothes, we're getting older. So the best way to get it is to take an oil-based gel cap of vitamin D. I say oil-based gel cap that you get very consistent rises in the 25 hydroxy vitamin D. If you take capsules with uh, powder or tablets, the absorption is so erratic as to be almost useless. I've seen this too many times. Somebody says, I'm taking 10,000 units of vitamin D, D3, in a tablet form, and that person's level goes from 17. I aim, I aim for 60 to 70. Their level goes from 17 to 21. Well, pff, hardly, hardly worth even trying. Drops are okay. They're just kind of erratic in dosing because it's very tough to regulate the quantity of, of drops. So that's another way, but it's kind of erratic. Mm -hmm. But oil-based gel caps, inexpensive, widely available. And, but even then, Brian, most of my colleagues can't get it right. They still say bonehead things like, oh, your level is 30. You're good. Or, oh, you got your level up to 62. You can stop your D now. No, it's an ongoing need. You have to do it all the time. So that's, that's emblematic, what goes on in healthcare. They're experts in health care generating revenues. They're am amateurs or entirely ignorant of issues in health. Even something as crucial to your health as vitamin D. Yeah. And, um, is, is that one of the main deficiencies that you're finding? What I know you mentioned magnesium. Is there anything else? Yeah. These are the deficiencies that are very common in modern life, not because of the diet, because of modern life. So vitamin right. D for the reasons we said, uh, magnesium, because you know what, I'd love to go to the river or stream and drink water running over minerals, but it's full of sewage and herbicide and pesticide. So we have to filter our water and water filtration removes all magnesium. Iodine, I don't know if you know this, but we, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, um, the Midwest used to be called the goiter belt. Oh, I didn't because, know that. Yeah, 20 to 35% of children especially had goiters and large thyroid glands on their neck. Really? And if, if your great grandmother was around and you say, hey, great grandma, tell me about goiters when you were a little girl. She'd say, Brian, you wouldn't believe what I saw when I was a little girl. My next door neighbor suffocated from her goiter. Mm. Uh, another friend down the street delivered a child with, mentally, with mental impairment. It was a huge problem. People died of it. It was one of the largest public health problems all throughout human history until it was figured out. It was from lack of iodine. Mm. And it was mostly internal areas of continents because uh, all the iodines in the ocean, most of the iodine in the world is in the ocean. People who are coastal had seafood, seaweed, and uh, soil that had some iodine in it. And we eat the livestock or plants that got iodine. But those of us internally, so there was wildly out of control goiters here until it was figured it was iodine. And that's why the FDA encouraged salt manufacturers, like Morton Salt in Chicago, to add iodine to table salt. 
And the, back then they'd say, use more iodized salt, keep your family goiter free. Mm-hmm. And it was such a big problem. Americans listened and gave them a taste for salt. Unfortunately, when the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services came out with dietary guidelines and said, cut your fat, eat more healthy whole grains, coupled with proliferation of processed foods by big food, and Americans became insulin resistant, Mm. which caused a sodium retention. So FDA, in their great confusion, said, "Uh, stop using all that salt. Mm. Not recognizing it was the insulin resistance that was causing the problem. So they tell everybody, cut your salt. So what's coming back? Goiters oh. and iodine deficiency. So uh, there are, are other deficiencies, but those four um, are kind of a core. Virtually everybody is deficient. Uh, there are other nutrients that can be deficient, but it varies by region, right. lifestyle, age, etc. And what prompted you? I know you mentioned a little bit your new book, Super Gut, um, regarding eliminating like bad bacteria, uh, bringing back some good bacteria. What what prompted you to get into that? Is, was it the fact that, you know, you, you had wheat belly and then you, and then uh, people were still coming back with some issues? Yeah, I was looking for holes in the program, even though, Brent, even though in the wheat belly program, I told mm. people, you know, let's accept we all screwed up our microbiomes because of antibiotics, herbicide, pesticide residues, glyphosate and Roundup, glyphosate is an herbicide, but it's also an antibiotic emulsifying agents and peanut butter, ice cream and salad dressing, synthetic sweeteners like aspartame and diet colas, uh, other drugs, stomach acid blocking drugs, a whole long list of things have mucked up the human microbiome. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I first started out by asking what microbes have we lost? So modern humans have lost hundreds of species, be- mostly because of antibiotics and to some degree, those other factors. Well, one of the microbes we almost all of us have lost is lactobacillus reuteri, R-E-U-T-E-R-I, my favorite microbe in the world, <laughs> named after the German microbiologist, Dr. Gerhard Reuter. And uh, it was clear that Reuteri is very susceptible to common antibiotics like ampicillin. So if you had a urinary tract infection or sinusitis or upper respiratory infection, took ampicillin, you probably wiped out all your Reuteri and so have most other people. Even though if we looked at the microbiomes of indigenous hunter-gatherers, they all have Reuteri. If you look at the microbiome of chipmunks and squirrels and raccoons and deer and chickens, they all have reuteri, suggesting it's probably very important, but we've lost it. So uh, I've restored, I, I work to restore reuteri, but we do it in a specific way. We make uh, a, a, an unusual way of making, we call it yogurt. It's not really yogurt, but it looks and smells like yogurt, but it's extended fermentation. And we get hundreds of billions of microbes when we perform flow cytometry on our yogurts, we get about 250, 260 billion counts of bacteria per half cup serving. Mm -hmm. And when people consume this yogurt, wonderful things happen. Um, So is this something you sort of came about yourself, just making it? And, or how did you, I guess, how did you come about making this? Well, it was inspired by a series of very elegant studies out of MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. There's a a cancer research group who was looking to the anti-cancer effects of Reuteri because Reuteri is known to kill off cancer cells in the intestinal tract. But they started giving Reuteri to mice and they saw that these mice had what they described as rich, luxuriant fur. So they studied these mice. What's going on here? They found that healing time for wounds was cut by 50% that um, uh, other mice got old and fat and stopped mating with each other. Mice that got reuteri stayed slender and youthful. They stayed youthful till death, Brian. They stayed youthful till death. (laughs) (laughs) Males had a, uh, old males had a restoration of youthful testosterone. There was preservation of mating behavior, even in old mice. Um, There was a reduction in appetite. There was increased, um, interest in other mice, sociability. There was restoration of youthful muscle. So I saw all that. Sure. So I, now some of that has been corroborated in humans, not all, but some of it. I got the microbes that they used. It comes from a product called BioGaia Gastrus, G-A-S-T-R-U-S. It's a Swedish product. The problem with that is that they sell the product for infants, for babies, to reduce colic, reduce infantile regurgitation of uh, formula or breast milk, uh, so 
it's really super low dose, 100 million of each bacteria. It sounds like a lot, but it's nothing when it comes to bacteria. That's mm -hmm. why I made yogurt. We ferment for 36 hours because rotorite doubles every three hours. They don't have sexual reproduction. They just double. So that's how we get these hundreds of billions. And everything that was seen in the, in the mouse experiments, has we've been seeing now in thousands of people. The, the way it works, this so was- every, well, oh, go, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, a, a, anybody can make this, right? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. This was very well explored by the MIT group. The way Rotary works is it takes up residence in the entire length of the GI tract, a little unusual, sends a signal via the vagus nerve up to the brain to release oxytocin. And your listeners likely recognize oxytocin because it's the hormone of love and empathy. And so, Brian, what people tell me when they eat the yogurt is, um, I like my family better. I, I like my coworkers better. I find them less annoying. I understand other people's points of view better. But there's even more. The ladies go nuts because there's an explosion in dermal collagen and they start to lose their skin wrinkles within a few weeks. And, but the other effects also are seen. Restoration of youthful muscle and strength. Uh, I'm a chronic insomniac. I, for years, I'd be watching TV, reading books at three o'clock in the morning. I now sleep straight through nine hours. Those of us who wear these actigraphic devices like Fitbit, Aura Ring, Apple Watch, are seeing about a 20% lengthening of REM sleep, the deep restorative phase of sleep that helps you maintain mental health. Your appetite is reduced, especially for snacking. Can you, um, sorry, can you get, can you buy this anywhere or is this something you have to make? Like, is this something that can come in like, what about like raw milk? No. So raw okay. milk has microbes in it, uh, but different, different species. Okay. So, so this is, so recall, this is something you're, we're all supposed to have. Right. So we're all supposed to get it from our moms at birth or through breastfeeding, but most moms have lost it because they've taken antibiotics and done other things also. So you have to actually purposely get it. So all those effects, uh, restoration, youthful muscle, smoother skin, deeper sleep, preservation of bone density. Brian, I, I really believe restoration of this one microbe turns the clock back 10 or 20 years. Your immune system is returned to that of a youthful person. Now that's one microbe. There's many, many others you can replace mm -hmm. and have fairly spectacular effects. Interesting. Yeah. I was just looking at it. Um, I see it right now on your website. Okay. So is this something that you have every, that, that you've been making it for yourself and your family every day pretty much? Or? Yeah. I consume it like every second or third day. Okay. Cause you know, it's not like a drug where you take it, it's metabolized and you pee it or poop it out. It's, it's a microbe that takes up residence and stays for a few days. Okay. Now it does raise some fundamental questions. If mom gave it to you, you'd probably have it for many years or a lifetime. Why, if you take it as a tablet or a yogurt, it only persists for a few days or a few weeks. It's mm -hmm. probably because we microbes are just like humans. You know, we live in families, communities. Well, microbes do too. And when microbes are allowed to live in there, what are called, what the microbiology community calls guilds or consortia, they have synergistic effects. So it's likely that sometime in the future, I'll say, Brian, don't just get the rotori, get rotori with these five other species and the rotori will take up long-term residence and maybe even have bigger effects. Mm. Interesting. And uh, what, what other, I guess, what other ways could you get it other than just making it? Obviously, I, I noticed you can obviously get it through supp some supplementation, right? Um, so the, the, the supplements that are sold currently are kind of low dose. Okay. One thing we don't know a lot about in the world of uh, microbes is what's called dose response. You know, if, if this was a drug, you know, those people in the pharmaceuticals have very deep pockets and they have the money to do, if you have a new drug, 0 0.25 milligrams, 0 0.5, 1.0, 1.5, 2.5, 5.0, 7.5. <laughs> they mm -hmm. can do these huge studies to explore dose response. Where does dose no longer effective, toxic, et cetera. Well, those are very expensive. So very little data like that in the world of uh, the microbiome. There's a little bit. Okay. Uh, one of the things we're going to do, by the way, is we have a mouse trial set up. We're going to explore. Uh, so the, the uh, strain of rotori we use, when you deal with microbes, you have to pay attention to strain, which is very tedious. But 
the best illustration is E. coli. So your listeners have E. coli, you and I have E. coli, but if you ate lettuce contaminated by cow manure with E. coli, you can die of that E. coli. So same species, E. coli, different strains. So we got to pay attention to strain. Mm -hmm. Well, the strains that come from that gastrous product, strains of rotary, uh, uh, mostly it's mostly uh, the ATC, I'm sorry about this, the ATCC PTA 6475 strain. <laughs> <laughs> Say that so, 20 times, huh? But I'll tell you, Brian, I've got seven other strains and I've made yogurt with all of them. And met, several of us have, and all the same effects apply. So we're going to do a mouse study and compare five. There's over a hundred strains. It's impossible mm. to test all of them. It's very costly. We're going to compare five strains and then we're going to generate a limited dose response curve. I want to know, is there a strain and a dose that is superior or better? I, I personally, I think it's 50 billion or more, and it's very difficult to get that in Rotary. That's why we make the yogurt mm. um, out of it, because that's an easy way to amplify bacterial counts. What other things can people do to maybe take control of their gut health? Perhaps they have, they're having other issues, skin issues and things like that. Um, well, yeah. What other things can they do? I know, like you mentioned, like fermenting vegetables and things like that. Mm -hmm. Well, so Rotary is just one example of an important microbe we've lost. There's many others. Uh, it's, it's important to think about lactobacillus gasseri and bacillus coagulans and fecalobacterium presnitzii. There's a whole bunch of them. And people go, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I yeah. tell them, don't, don't worry. Think about this like a menu at a restaurant. You don't freak out when you see all those items. You pick and choose the dishes you want. Same thing here. Pick mm. the microbe you want for the effect you want. So I, I give kind of a menu of microbes and how to get them. Uh, but the other side of this is when you've lost important uh, microbes, unfortunately, unhealthy bacterial species have proliferated to take their place. And even worse, in an astounding number of, of Americans, these unhealthy microbes have not just proliferated, they've ascended up into the 24 feet of small bowel. So that's called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Mm -hmm. And I was guilty, Brian, up till a few years ago, I think it was a rare thing. I used to tell people, oh, you probably don't have it. Oh, yeah. It's, well, the thing that changed my mind was this thing here. It's the AIR device, A-I-R-E. You blow into it. It talks to your smartphone and it registers how much hydrogen gas you're producing mm -hmm. because microbes produce, un mostly unhealthy microbes produce hydrogen gas, but you don't. So you can use it to map out where bacteria are in your GI tract. Mm -hmm. uh, I have no relationship with the company. The, the founder and inventor, Dr. Angus Short in Dublin, Ireland, become a friend. He's a good guy. Um, but I have, they're not paying yeah, me to say these things. Yeah, no. That, yeah, what's the name of that? What's it called? It, it's called the AIR device, A-I-R-E. And the company is Food Marble. Okay. Uh, they just came out with a new device literally, literally two weeks ago two weeks ago, Brian. And it measures now not just hydrogen gas, but also methane gas. Now it's a couple hundred bucks. Um, uh, the, re the, the formal test uh, is done in a lab or clinic. And that's about $300 or more every time you do it. Because once you dive into this world, you need to repeat testing. This thing can be used over and over and over again. You can share it with your family. Hmm. Probably not with your friends and coworkers because it's like sharing a toothbrush, you know? You All put it right. in your mouth. So, <laughs> but... Um, but when I got my hands on this, uh, it became clear. So Angus Short, the inventor, thought it was a device just for people with irritable bowel syndrome trying to follow a low FODMAPS diet, low fiber, low sugar diet. Mm -hmm. I got a hold of it. I said, Angus, I called him. I said, this is not just that. This is a device that can be used to map out where bacteria are and to decipher the meaning of food intolerances, mm -hmm. like histamine-containing foods, nightshades, uh, sorbitol, fructose, fruit, legumes, all the things that, so I can't eat those. I get excessive gas, diarrhea, migraine headaches, etc. Well, these are forms of SIBO. So the, the, the solution is not to avoid eggplant or tomatoes or, or uh, legumes. Mm -hmm. The solution is to correct the seed, the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Now that's, that's kind of a tall order, but I tell you when I, when I started having people, thousands of them testing, I was shocked. It's the rare person who doesn't have it. Really? Now we could we could challenge the validity of the test, except that this, this is what I saw. People would test negative. It's a zero to ten. They test ten, right? And then they take steps to eradicate the SIBO, and then uh, their 
they would finally lose the 40 pounds they wanted to lose or their hemoglobin A1C finally dropped or their, they no longer had flare ups of their um, uh, seborrhea or, or ulcerative colitis. So I saw real results and the H2 gas level would drop to 1.2 or something like that. Mm. Now, the, the problem with this is if you go to the doctor and say, doc, I think I have SIBO. And he says, why? Well, I tested or I have telltale signs like fat malabsorption, fat droplets in the toilet. Or I have one of the conditions that are synonymous with SIBO, like restless leg syndrome, rosacea, mm-hmm. um, neurodegenerative disorders, autoimmune disorders, fibromyalgia, a lot of irritable bowel syndrome, fatty liver. Those are all huge risk of uh, having SIBO. So the, doc- the doctor typically says, oh, did you consult Dr. Google again, Brian? Right. Uh, or some other knuckleheaded comment like that. Occasionally, you'll get someone who's, oh, okay. Here's a prescription for rifaximin, the antibiotic for SIBO. Unfortunately, it rarely ever comes with a discussion how you got it, how to increase the efficacy, because only 40 to 60% effective, how to prevent recurrences, which is the rule. So very unsatisfying experience in the conventional world, even from a gastro, most gastroenterologists. You can use herbal antibiotics. And I did that for a couple of years. And there's two regimens that actually have uh, evidence for, eff- for efficacy, the candibactin regimen and the FC cytal dysbiocyte. They're, they're supplements. You can buy them over the counter, like through Amazon. And they do work. And there's one study comparing those things to refaxin, and they're superior. They, at least in this one study. And they not only outperformed the refaxin, they uh, were successful in refaxin failures. But you know what? I started, I, I asked different questions. One of the questions I asked, why if you took a commercial probiotic doesn't SIBO go away? So if you pay a lot of money for a commercial probiotic and took it and you tested positive or you have all the telltale signs or a condition synonymous with SIBO, if you took a commercial probiotic, your SIBO will not go away. You might reduce yeah. bloating or diarrhea a little bit, but you still got the SIBO. So I asked different questions. I asked, what if we chose microbes that colonize the upper GI tract? That's where SIBO is. And what if we chose species that produce what are called bactericins? These are natural antibiotics effective against the species of SIBO. So I chose three. I chose a strain of Lactobacillus gasseri. I chose our old friend, Lactobacillus rotori, mm-hmm. and a strain of Bacillus coagulans. We co-ferment them. So simultaneous fermentation, but extended fermentation. So we get big, big, big numbers of bacteria, consume a half cup. And now this is very preliminary, Brian, but so far about 30 people have converted H2 negative with the yogurt. And you know, it's yogurt. You know, if I said you're going to have your colon removed, you better be damn confident you got the diagnosis (laughs) right. But if I said, try this yogurt, (laughs) yeah, the, the, the bar is low. And so... Uh, based on that very limited evidence, I'm encouraging people to get, at least give it a try. That recipe, where to get the because you have to source the microbes from different sources. So it, there's a little bit of cost and hassle, but you know what? It, it's it, I think it's better than taking antibiotics. Uh, now we'll publish this evidence formally down the road, not as yogurt as we'll have to encapsulate it uh, to, to prove that this works. But so far, cross my fingers, it seems mm. to be working. And. Uh... The um the yogurt recipe is on your website, right? I think is it on on doctored or or well, I see it is, that. Yeah, it's on my blog. It's on okay. the I just uh, my wheat belly blog. I I transitioned over to uh, dr davis infinite health dot oh, right. com. Okay, blog. <laughs> okay. You got lots of blogs. So. <laughs> well, you know, I had the, the wheat. I was reluctant to give up the wheat belly blog because it had uh, thirty million visits, mm. but. You know this. You can't manage right. tons of websites and social. You got to so I consolidate everything as much as I could into drdavisinfinitehealth.com. Uh, oh, that makes sense. Um, wow. What What are your opinions? I was just curious about like for the colon hydrocolon therapy. Um, do you have any thoughts around that? You know, a good friend of mine is Brenda Watson. She is the g- grandmother of uh, colonic. Uh, uh, cleansing has been doing it for gee, 20 some years, 30 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's written several books, has, has had numerous PBS shows. I just visited her last week. Oh, okay. she, she and her husband Stan were the founders of Renew Life, the probiotic company. Okay. It was the largest probiotic company uh, for many years until uh, of all odd things, Clorox bought it 
mm. <laughs> in 2017. Really? But uh, I've, I've, ta- I've had long conversations with Brenda about this. And what it amounts to, I believe, is it debulks a diseased uh, a colonic microbiome. In other words, you're kind of just washing the colon and you're debulking. It's like if you have a tumor. If you debulk the tumor surgically, you have to follow it up. I, I'm not advocating this, but you mm. follow it up with radiation therapy and chemotherapy because even though you debulked it, you removed the bulk of it, there's still right microscopic metastases and cells you can't see. Same thing here. You're debulking a disease colonic microbiome. What you're not doing is cleaning the small bowel because you can't reach up that high because uh, even if you cleaned all five feet of the colon, there's another 24 feet of small bowel and your colonic. Th- so it, it could play a role. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not so convinced it's really a necessary step. I think you can accomplish a lot of things. Like I don't think that uh, fecal transplant is all that necessary uh, if you do the right things in the microbiome. And of course, there's been some problems with, with a fecal transplant. There was a death from fecal transplant. So it's not entirely benign prospect. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I was just curious. I, I haven't done that in years. And then I just decided to go do it. And just as <laughs> I figured I'll ask you, um, what other, I don't know, I mentioned, um, are there any other steps? Obviously this, the, the, um, the yogurt probiotic obviously sounds really great. And are there any other steps people that could do that maybe just don't want to make something or let's we'll just say, obviously cleaning up your diet is so key. Um, fermenting vegetables, uh, what else could someone do on a daily basis? I think one of the most important things, and I, unfortunately, there's no way to do this like in a pill. You know, people say, oh, just give me a pill. Well, you can't do it in a pill. <laughs> mm. It means reordering your diet. It means avoiding certain things. I, I liken this to a backyard garden. So you and I live in a similar climate. If, if you want to have a garden in May or June, why do you do that? Well, you prepare maybe a 10 by 10 plot. You pick out the sticks and stones and the weeds then you plant seeds and then you water and fertilize the growing season. And after a couple of months, you got a whole bunch of zucchini and cucumbers and squash and tomatoes. Mm-hmm. Same thing, same principles apply to cultivating the microbiome. You, you prepare the soil. You don't drink chlorinated drinking water. You filter your water. We try to buy uh, organic foods whenever possible because less herbicide pesticides. Minimize reliance on antibiotics whenever possible. Half the antibiotics prescribed are inappropriate. So recognize when they are inappropriate. Mm-hmm. Like when the doctor says, oh, you have a viral upper restaurant, take this antibiotic just in case. <laughs> That's an inappropriate use of antibiotics. Uh, so clean up, prepare the soil. Right. Seeds, the most important seed is not a probiotic because commercial probiotics currently are very haphazard collections of microbes. No thought to uh, a number of important factors like those collaborative guilds. The only product I know of that actually has done that is a product called BiotaQuest Sugar Shift. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And once again, I have no reason to say that except I know the founders, Martha Carlin and Dr. Raul Cano and microbiologists, and they're devoted to this process. They're very smart. And it's the only product I know where they actually put together a collaborative guild and that uh, what we saw, we had about 20 people in my audience do it. And they saw a 10 milligram drop in fasting glucose really? in non-diabetics. A big, that's a big effect. That's like a drug effect. It's what's a very big effect. What's the name of it? It's BiotiQuest, B-I-O-T-I Quest. And the product is called Sugar Shift. Okay. Um, uh, Martha Carlin uh, has a husband who developed Parkinson's disease at age 44 and she's been working for several years trying to find a, a, a microbial solution. By the way, I think they may have found a partial solution. They have yet to do the clinical trial. Uh, they're going to do that. One of the things that this sugar shift does is it uh, takes sugars like fructose, sucrose, glucose, and converts it to another sugar called mannitol. Mannitol is not metabolizable by humans, but it can get into the brain. And animal models suggest that mannitol, this is Martha's, Um, thinking, there's some animal evidence that mannitol dissolves the alpha-synuclein protein that accumulates in the brains of people with with Parkinson's disease. Hmm. And she's seen her husband, a number of people who've taken, she's seen them, not full remission, but partial remission. So I think they're onto something there. Hmm. They have yet to prove it though. They're going to do a clinical trial. They're in the mean, right right as we speak, setting up for the clinical trial. Uh, But 
my point in all this is the current crop of commercial probiotics are very unsatisfactory just because there's not a lot of rhyme or reason. The best thing you can do to seed your microbiome are fermented foods, the yogurts, kimchi is at the top of the list. It's loaded with healthy microbes like Pediococcus pentasaceus and Leuconostoc mesenteritis. These are really powerful microbes. Fermented sauerkraut, not, not just salted in, in brine and vinegar, but fermented. Mm -hmm. For, and this should be a near no cost process, Brian. You can just ferment veggies on your kitchen counter. I have a number of things fermenting on my kitchen counter right now. Kombuchas, water kefirs, dairy kefirs, uh, the fermented meats, there's a whole bunch of fermented foods and it's becoming clearer and clearer, adding back fermented foods that most modern people have long forgotten ever since yeah. the uh, availability of home refrigeration in 1927. We all forgot, but our grandmothers or great grandmothers would say, Brian, of course we fermented our food. How else do we keep our food fresh through the winter without a refrigerator? Mm. But that was a constant flow of microbes Fermenting that, that meat. We, fermenting meat. Yeah. Mm, interesting. I've not done much of it, but you know, it's still popular in many parts of Europe and Asia hmm. where they take a, a chunk of meat, hang it outside, maybe cover it with a cloth, keep the flies off, come back two weeks later, take off a slice. And it's filled with those, the, the, those wonderful microbes, Lactobacillus brevis, Pediococcus species, Leuconostoc species. These are really uh, beneficial species, but they're in fermented foods. And the, the curious thing, uh, research out of Stanford, a uh, husband-wife team, Justin and Erica Sonnenberg, just about four or five months ago, published a very important study that showed that when you consume a lot of fermented foods, I'm talking about like five, six, seven times a day, mm. not huge, small amounts. Um, those microbes in the fermented foods are not the ones that take up residence, interestingly. So you may get, say, this really powerful bacteria called Leuconostoc mesenteroides by eating, let's say, kimchi. But it's not the Leuconostoc that takes up residence. It may for a brief period, but it seems to cultivate the other, numerous other healthy microbes. It's not quite clear exactly how that works. No one's figured that out yet. Mm. So it's, it's the start. It would be like you plant seeds for tomatoes and tomatoes, zucchini, cucumbers, and squash come up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, gut health's something that like, would you agree people should start with a lot of times when they're looking to upgrade their health? Um, and sometimes it gets overlooked, you know? Yeah. But one thing people say, oh, I can't do that. I tried fermented foods and made me sick, or I took a probiotic and it made me sick, or I took a prebiotic fiber to feed my microbes like legumes or onions or garlic or inulin powder. And it made me really sick. I had a panic attack. I had diarrhea. I had bloating, um, et cetera. Well, the problem is not the food or the probiotic or the fine. It's your microbiome. It's just like all those food intolerances. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the tomato. It's right. you <laughs> and your microbiome. Mm. So uh, unfortunately, most of my colleagues won't be very helpful with some exceptions. And so that's what it is, you know, because I love when you and I get access to devices or insights or tools that we can use at home. I like in this, Brian, the air device to like having finger stick glucoses. You're too young to remember. But before we had finger stick glucoses in the 1980s, mid 80s, all they had was urine dipsticks and it was misery because they were so imprecise. Mm. I had a faculty member at St. Louis U where I went to medical school at age 29, this young woman was already blind in kidney failure and had an amputation. That's how bad it was. Mm. Or imagine you had a three-year-old playing in the backyard who's a type one diabetic and uh, she passes out, goes into a coma. Well, is her blood sugar 900 and she's going to diabetic ketoacidosis and kidney failure in the next few minutes? Or is her blood sugar 50 and she's going to die of brain damage in the next three minutes? How do you tell? You're in dip? No. Mm -hmm. So ha having finger stick blood glucose and now continuous glucose monitoring was a game changer for diabetes. Yeah. This is the same kind of game changer for intestinal health. But uh, once again, you, people don't have to buy it. It is nice to know about, though, mm -hmm. in case you're, you know, if you get your, one of the difficulties with SIBO is let's say you say, okay. I eradicated my SIBO because it was causing me a lot of bloating, skin rashes, and depression. That's a biggie, by the way. And joint pain. 
I got rid of my SIBO. Oh, I'm so much better. But six months later, you have a panic attack. Is that SIBO? Because you can come back with a different constellation of symptoms because different microbes can take over that had different symptoms. Well, you could just say, oh, I think it's SIBO. And, and, or you could see if it's SIBO or not. You'll know within minutes in the comfort of your own kitchen. Wow. That's, yeah. It's amazing. These devices now, like you mentioned, the continuous glucose monitors or like the aura ring or all these wearables. It's, I think, I think they're great. And, and, um, like I'll have to check out that air device. I think that's, I'm, I'm surprised I haven't heard I mean, Is it, is it pretty new or has it been around? The, the first, this is the old device. I'm I, my, the new one with uh, methane measurement is, is on its way, okay. but this came out, I think, 2018, 2019, something like okay. that. Now, here's the confusing thing, because Angus Short, uh, PhD engineer, thought it was a device for IBS and FODMAPs. You might get the instructions. I have not seen the new instructions, okay. uh, but when I, I told Angus, hey, this is far more than that, I believe they changed the instructions, okay. but I, the instructions on how to use it the right way is in my book. Got it. Because because they'll tell you to use it uh, if you have IBS and if you have five maps exposure. Well, that's not you can do it that way, but there's other ways to use this device. It's just like glucose. So the gl glucose meters you know, have been used for years to manage diabetes. Mm -hmm. What the doctors didn't tell you is you can use a glucose meter to get rid of diabetes. Also, use it a little differently. Same thing here. There's a way to use this to get rid of SIBO and food intolerances. Uh, but you might have to consult my book to get the right way. I'll, I'll see when I get the new, new device. I mean, literally, <laughs> the first shipment went out two weeks ago. It's that okay. new. <laughs> um, wow. Well, this is a lot of good information. Um, I, I usually close a lot of my interviews with this, a similar question. And what, what advice would you give an individual, maybe uh, middle-aged uh, 50 years and above that's looking to maybe get their body back to what it once was maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago. What, what one tip would you give that individual? Well, there's, it does involve some effort. Sadly, <laughs> the doctor in most cases will be no help. They'll make fun of you. They'll say, oh, there's nothing wrong with you. Don't worry about it. When you, know, when you pass blood or have chest pain, then call me. That's not health. Or we're going to screen you for colon cancer with a colonoscopy, but never tell you that there are steps you can take to prevent colon cancer from every developing. Mm -hmm. And that, by the way, is a microbiome conversation. It's quite clear colon cancer is a microbiome disease. Interesting observation. If you have a uh, bacteria called Fusobacterium nucleatum in your mouth, uh, people who have gingivitis and periodontitis uh, and cavities, et cetera, have a lot of that microbe. Mm -hmm. Well, if you take a piece of colon cancer out of your colon, you'll find it filled with that microbe. Mm -hmm. How did it get from here, from the mouth to the colon? Well, you think, oh, swallowing, right? No, it gets into the bloodstream and seeds your colon. And when you find it, when you get take colon cancer out, it has 200-fold greater populations than normal of this microbe, mm -hmm. uh, Fusobacterium. And if you take fusobacterium and put it in a mouse's colon, they promptly get colon cancer. So now that kind of insight and others similar, why doesn't the gastroenterologist say, okay, yeah, we may do a colonoscopy, but the real prevention is let's look at your teeth. Let's look at your oral health. Let's make sure you don't have SIBO. Let's reorganize your microbiome so you don't get colon cancer. But no, ka-ching, ka-ching. Let's go for the colonoscopy. Let's go for the money. And that's, that's what's wrong. It's emblematic what's wrong with healthcare. It's all about money. It has nothing to do with health. And so um, I, I don't know of one thing. In that your I know. Word. I know. <laughs> I, I put you in a tough spot, right? It's tough to pick one thing. <laughs> I will tell you, you know, given my years of the wheat belly lifestyle, just all, the, all wheat belly is, is recognizing what agribusiness and geneticists did to wheat. They changed it completely. Right. And it's, they amplified a lot of the toxic effects. So we take it out of the diet uh, because it wasn't really part of the diet for 99.6% of human time on this planet. It's a relatively new addition. And certainly right. the, the modified version is. Then we address those nutrients, that handful of nutrients that are largely lacking in a modern life. Mm -hmm. So those two things... And by the way, those nutrients all impact insulin resistance, 
which is the driving force behind obesity, overweight, type 2 diabetes, prediabetes, hypertension, coronary disease, and dementia, and cancer too. So just those two things are powerful, but you can take it even further, like with Reuteri and other microbes, where we're seeing people turn back the clock, Brian, truly 10, 20 years. Wow. Yeah. And um, this is all great information. We could probably go <laughs> another hour. Uh, we'll keep it in an hour, but I really do appreciate you coming on here, Dr. Davis. And um, yeah, where's the best place for people to find you? I know you, you have it all in, in one spot, right? So the, the new website is drdavisinfinitehealth.com. There's a blog, as you know, there's an, a, a membership inner circle for people who every Wednesday, uh, well, most Wednesdays, I do this, me with 70 to 100 people. And we talk about SIBO and some of the things we didn't touch on, fungal overgrowth, methanogen overgrowth, uh, all the yogurts we do. Um, you you, you want to make bacillus coagulans yogurt because you want to you recover from exercise faster. Uh, or you want to make uh, bifidobacterium infantis yogurt for your child because you want that child to have less likely to have asthma, irritable bowel syndrome, less likely to be obese and have a higher IQ. Mm. <laughs> so we talk about all those kinds of things. That's the inner circle. And of course, the super gut book. Excellent. Well, this was great. And um, yeah, I can't wait to get your new book. And I, I appreciate you coming on. <laughs> sure thing, Brian. And keep doing what you're doing, because I don't know if you know this, you and me can no longer get on major network TV nor print media because the yeah. influence of big pharma is so powerful nowadays that especially since they've gotten to the world of direct consumer drug advertising on TV and print media, that the billions and billions of dollars they spend means the media doesn't want people like you and me spouting off saying things that might be antagonistic to big pharma. So mm -hmm. what you're doing is so important. Well. I appreciate that. I've enjoyed it as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for listening to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I understand there are millions of other podcasts out there and you've chosen to listen to mine. And I appreciate that. Check out the show notes at briangrin.com for everything that was mentioned in this episode. Feel free to subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend or family member that's looking to get their body back to what it once was. Thanks again and have a great day.